No, I have to say it, Mitch. Showtime. Hey, heads up, everybody. It's showtime. Oh, it's time. All right, ladies, buckle up. It's showtime. <laughs> Welcome to Stanko Stance Podcast. John Stanko back behind the mic, being joined by Mike Phillip once again. Mike Phillips, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good, my friend. How are you? Doing all right. We're wrapping up 2019. We're wrapping up the 2010 decade. And Mike, you're joining me today because we're going to count down our top 10 favorite films of this past decade. I have done a lot of thinking about this, so I'm very excited for this one. Yes, it is a very broad topic. I purposely did not give you a lot of like definition with it because... I think movies are subjective, and the way we identify and define favorite is different for all of us. So before we begin, how did you approach researching your top 10 favorite movies of the decade? Well, favorite movies, I looked at a couple things. Number one, I had to actually go through the decade and remember what movies came out in this decade because there's Mm -hmm. so many, and I've seen so many. Most, Not as much the last three years because, you know, life happens, all that good stuff. But in terms of favorite, I mean a couple of things. Number one. What got me hooked? What made me want to go to the theater and say, you know what, I have to go see this movie? And then once I got there, would I, A, consider going to it again, or B, buying the whole media? Because for me, if I'm willing to throw the extra cash down to have a copy whenever I want it, I think that's a great point towards the favorite status. And I like, obviously, a good story. I want to be entertained. I want a good performance. And proper use of the source material is huge to me, especially if you're coming off a book or a show Hmm. Do not screw with it. I mean, last airbender. Hello. <laughs> the show was amazing. And my Shyamalan took it and threw it in the garbage can. <laughs> yeah, not that was not a very good movie. You pay, you have pitched the idea of the worst 10 movies of the decade or 10 biggest bombs, which I think may be an idea for a separate podcast. And that, I think, might be on your list. It might be on both of our lists, if we're being fair. It's the, I think it's right near the top of my list. I mean, the list is very, for me, the, the bombs is pretty much – falls into two categories, either terrible use of source material or unnecessary sequels. <laughs> <laughs> unnecessary sequels, I definitely can get behind you on that one. Yeah. Um, so that's a very good point. I really love the point like about buying it for uh, your personal use after it's in theaters. I didn't think about that kind of when I was going through identifying my 10 favorite, but now looking at my list, I think it definitely applies to the movies that I chose. So that's a really good point on your part. Because it's like for me, it's like, I also have the Netflix DVD plan, which not many people still do. It's like, Again, I didn't know that existed until I, uh, until I recorded with you a couple weeks ago. So Yeah, so like if, if I'm going to put it on the queue and get it again, to me, that's something that qualifies for favorite status. All right, that's a fair point. Uh, I think in terms of the way I looked at favorite, um, I think rewatchability uh, is not as high on the list as I thought it might be, uh, as strange as that sounds, because sometimes really, really good movies that you love are really hard to watch again. For instance, for instance, this is not on my list, but I loved A Fault in Our Stars. I don't want to watch that movie again because I don't want to cry a thousand times. That's fair. But uh, but rewatchability is part of it. I think the biggest thing is is if the movie makes me think about it after it's over. If I'm thinking about different aspects of the movie, whether it be the acting, whether it be the story, whether it be dangling plot points that possibly lead to a sequel but you don't necessarily need one, I think that's a really big part of the way I choose favorite. And then also, if I can just tell, if I can tell that the director or the people running the show of this movie loved making it and they had a passion about it, if that's coming through the screen and I could feel it in my bones, that's a huge bonus point for me in terms of liking it and favoriting it as a movie. So you're only human after all. I am human (laughs) after all. Even though I'm not a huge fan of dogs, Mike, (laughs) I am human after all. I always say I cry more in movies than I do in real life, as sad as that is. Yeah, well, you don't like dogs. That explains a lot. <sighs> That's a fair point. That's a topic for an entirely different podcast. Yeah, we have we have a few friends who would probably argue with you if you were talking about this dog. Oh, every dog single set. friend argues with me about this dog point. Yeah. Every single one. Uh, but all right, so what we're going to do here for the audience, we have our top 10 favorite movies of the decade. Me and Mike are going to run through our 10 through 6 pretty quick. Just go in order, maybe one or two sentences about each. And then eventually we're going to get to 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, which we will alternate our picks. So, Mike, I ask you, do you want to go first or do you want to go second in your 10 through 6? I'll go first in the 10 through 6. You'll go first. All right, here we go. All right, number 10, Toy Story 3, back in 2010. Not just a great animated film. People don't realize this was a film that actually got a Best Picture nom. Did a great job of bringing home the story of those original characters. Tied all neatly into a bow. You know, we got an unnecessary sequel nine years later, but I think it was a great movie. Number nine for me, Dunkirk. I love Nolan movies. Like, pretty much every Nolan movie except for The Dark Knight Rises made this list for me. This is, I think, the best made of the films of the decade. 
Massive use of time to tell the story. Historical value is great, but did not grab as much as a rewatch value as the other one, which is why it's down here. Number 842, the Jackie Robinson movie. I see your face already. You have issues with that. But to me, I love Chadwick Boseman's performance as Jackie Robinson. I can't look you in the eye yeah. right now. I can't yeah. do it. I like the Lucas Black performance as Pee Wee Reese. And the Ben Tudyk scene as, as uh, Ben, Alan Tudyk scene as Ben Chapman to me, I think just really hooked me. I'm like, this really grounded the movie to me. It brought some realism to it. I love that aspect of that movie. Number seven, Rogue One. The Star Wars movie, the only Star Wars movie on my list for favorite movies of the decade because I liked it more than either of the movies that came out from the Skywalker saga because they something bold. They decide, you know what, we're going to kill our entire cast at the end of the movie, which to me, great choice. Resist the urge to make an unnecessary sequel. I had a lot of fun with this movie, and the cast full of blood together, good movie, and good job fitting in the continuity of the film because it takes you right from the end of this into the beginning of episode four, which I think is nice. And number six, Now You See Me. The I like this movie. It's another one John is not thrilled with. And I just love the heist movie aspect. I thought the cast was fun. I like the star power of Ruffalo, Freeman, Kane, Eisenberg, Woody Harrelson. And I was enjoyed the misdirection. I thought that was fun. And I could tell those are the two that he has issues with. I do have issues with those last two. But again, movies are subjective. Yeah. What you like is is, is kind of catered to you. I can't I'm not gonna be able to convince you either way whether those are good movies or not. Yeah. Those are your favorites. So I was definitely respectfully disagree with Now You See Me. I gave that movie a D. I thought it was just bad. Uh, but again, it's your favorite. Uh and forty two, I admit I'm in the minority. I didn't love it. I gave it a C minus. I thought it was too Disneyfied for the story it was trying to tell. Um and I think I would have preferred a more grounded down to earth kind of more drama story rather than Disneyfied version of it. Um, but in terms of Toy Story 3, we may have some overlap on that one. Um, Dunkirk, I love so much. That is actually in my top 10 best movies of the decade. Uh, that's on that list for me. So definitely agree with those two. And I will also agree with you, Mike. Rogue One is the best of the most recent Star Wars additions to the to the entire Star, Star Wars saga. Loved Rogue One so much. Yeah, Rogue One was great. Just not getting enough love because I feel like it gets loved with Solo in terms of the movies because Solo is not as good as Rogue One was. But Rogue One is just a movie that I think can stand on its own. If you did not even call it Star Wars, you just called it Rogue One and not had no Star Wars element, I think it would still be a good movie. Yeah, and I think I loved – you mentioned how there's no unnecessary sequel to it. That's because you knew the end point of it because guess what? You know where the plans have to go. They have to get to the rebel base, but you also know none of those characters are in the rest of the Star Wars saga. That They have a final end point, but they still are able to make that ending really profound and make you feel it. So I definitely agree with you. I agree with you on – I like three of your three of your top uh, three of your top ten thus far. Gonna dis respectfully disagree on 42 and Now You See Me. I love how Trevor you got to Now You See Me. Now You See Me is just not a very good movie. <laughs> Though it's better than the sequel, because Now You See Me 2. That was trash. Is even worse. Yeah, that was complete trash, that movie. <laughs> All right, so, um, again, your 10 through 6 include Toy Story 3, Dunkirk, 42, Rogue One, and Now You See Me. Um, all right, for myself, going through from 10 to 6, number 10, my most recent addition to the list, Parasite. Came out this year. It is the best movie of this year by far that I have seen. Some of the best filmmaking I've ever seen. Bong Joon Ho, unbelievable. The way this the way this movie looks is great. The way it blends genres is off is awesome, and the way it also can tell a kind of hidden tale about social inequity, uh, not only in Korea where it takes place, but it can be applied on a global scale is really profound. So Parasite is my number ten. Number nine is the horror movie It, which came out in 2017. This movie kind of really capped off my Stephen King fandom. It kind of sent me down a rabbit hole of Stephen King. I think I've read over 10 of his books in the past two years, and it really kind of just pushed me to that limit. Bill Skarsgård is terrifying. Um, this movie, it was great. I loved it. I love a well-made horror movie, and it definitely uh, it was a blockbuster in terms of popularity, and it definitely struck that tone with me. Uh, number eight, it's uh, we agree on this one, Toy Story 3. I bawled my eyes out, Mike. I cried my eyes out. <laughs> this movie came at the perfect time for me. Uh, I was literally graduating high school, going to college, and Andy was giving away his toys at that exact same moment, and it triggered all the emotions for so, me. So there's a heart in there. There is a heart in there. Toy Story 3 definitely grabbed it. Uh, number seven is another horror movie, Hereditary, by Ari Aster. Um, came out in 2018. I mentioned earlier how sometimes your favorite movies are tough to rewatch because you know what's coming. That is Hereditary. This, The last 20 minutes of this movie, Mike, are some of the scariest 20 minutes I've ever seen. And again, it's a well-directed, well-made horror movie. I absolutely love it. When people ask for a horror movie recommendation, this is the first one that I go to. 
and I tell them to watch this movie. So that's my number seven. And then rounding out my uh, number six is going to be Logan from 2017. In my opinion, the best superhero movie of this past decade. Um, it's fantastic. Hugh Jackman gives a real heart profound performance as Logan. Uh, James Mangold directs the heck out of this movie. Patrick Stewart is really, really good in kind of a limited role playing someone limited to a wheelchair, but still gives a great, uh, great performance. And Logan, the way it looked and how it was different from all the other X-Men movies and all the other superhero movies that came before it, that is my number six favorite movie of the decade. I agree with a lot of those picks, especially Logan, because I feel like that was on my honorable mention yeah, list. It is on your honorable mentions list, yep. Yeah, because I love that movie when it came out because they, they basically took the character, and he deserved that kind of treatment because, like, it's hard to, like, disney Lo- like Wolverine because, like, in the ca- in the comic books, I mean, he's a very rough edge character, and, like, this is the closest you get to his full realization in terms of the comic book vision on the screen. And I think... Obviously, having Deadpool be, have success in an R-rated superhero movie set the stage for it, but I think it was a well-done choice to end the Hugh Jackman saga as Wolverine. People forget that was his last Wolverine appearance, that movie. And it should be his yeah. last. He should not reprise it because it was a great conclusion. Um, I don't know if you remember the first trailer for Logan. It was to Johnny Cash's song Hurt, yep. and it was the slow music and the slow profound, like just the, the fading in and out of the apocalyptic world and yep. the world that Logan was living in. That trailer is probably one of the best trailers of the decade for me because it immediately grasped me for the tone of the movie and fell in love with it right away from that moment. Yeah, it does. And Jack is a great performance because obviously in the past the movies, like Wolverine's indestructible, mm-hmm. like he's got a rapid healing factor, and you see him as this battered, beaten old man at this at that point in the series. Well, and like, yeah, and not only physically but also mentally. Yeah, he's mentally broken at a point in this movie. Yeah. And the fact that he finds new purpose in trying to rescue this girl who, like, has his, some of his DNA in him because like, it was a scientific experiment. Like, that was a good way to bring the character home. Yeah. Uh, again, fantastic movie. So, again, to recap my 10 through 6, uh, we have Parasite, It, Toy Story 3, uh, Hereditary, and Logan. Sounds good to me. All right. We're, we're doing a pretty good start thus far. Not too much disagreement, but now we're going to get into the nitty-gritty. We're going to, get, going to go to our favorite five movies of the decade. So why don't you go first? What is your number five movie of the decade? Number five, I had to get one Marvel in there. I'm a Marvel guy. I choose to put in Infinity War as number five on my list because I think this movie makes the cut because it does what Endgame could not in terms of making a complete movie around a of all these gigantic cast of characters. We basically had everybody from the MCU in there, but... The thing they did is they didn't focus in on Iron Man or Captain America. They focused it on Thanos, the villain of the movie. I thought that was a bold choice, and I liked that it was the Thanos story. And Thanos is going on in, on his own like like religious quest to collect all the stones. And the characterization, the acting from Josh Brolin is great. I dug that thing. And the thing that's pretty cool about this one is that unlike a lot of superhero movies, the heroes lost at the end. Half of them died and got dusted to nothing. Thanos won, and at the end we see him resting, and his journey is complete, and I think it's a great choice. It shocked the hell out of every theater I was in for the first time. Dead silence at the end of the movie as the credits are playing, and that's something we don't get very often in a movie like that. I think that's why it has to be in the top five for me. Uh, I, I do. I liked Infinity War. I liked it a lot more than Endgame. I think looking back on the movies, I think Infinity War, like you said, is just a better overall story. Um, I do think Thanos was a very, very good bad guy, especially in that movie. I love when a bad guy wins. There's yeah. really something so satisfactory about it is seeing the bad guy win. And at the end of that movie, it sparked a whole entire meme and GIF culture with the snap, right? Yeah. You're snapping everyone into oblivion, yeah. literally destroying them. Uh, it had a huge cultural impact. And I agree. I would agree with you. This is probably one of the better Marvel movies that I saw this decade. You you know I'm not a huge Marvel fan. Uh, not, and, not really anymore. <laughs> no, not really anymore. But in terms of the way this one was was able to combine the whole story, I do think it was pretty well done. Um, I don't have any Marvel in my top ten or even in my honorable mentions, uh, really. But in terms of pure movie theater going experience, the end to this one was very shocking. So yeah. I, as I know your fandom for Marvel, this is a very good pick on your part. Yeah. I like it. Yes, yeah, so that was. I think that's a good pick. Where's your fifth? My fifth is a 2014 movie by the name of Whiplash. Yeah. Have you seen Whiplash? Uh, not recently. No. Well, anyone who hasn't seen Whiplash, you need to watch it again because J.K. Simmons gives the best supporting actor performance I have ever, ever seen. Um, again, this movie is a really, really hard rewatch because it is dark. There is not many happy moments in this movie, Mike. But it is 
directed the hell out of by, by Damian uh, Chazelle. Just unbelievable job. J.K. Simmons is argue, I might, might be the best performance of the decade in general uh, in terms of the, the the horrendous teacher that he is. And then Miles Teller also gives probably his best leading role performance of, of all time as well. Um, this movie, it, it, there are so many good lines from it. I particularly love the line, there are no two words more harmful in the English language than good job. Uh, that just there's so many just kind of crushing someone's self-esteem. This movie beats you down to a pulp. And then by the end, when that final drum solo happens, you're so invested in not only Andrew trying to redeem himself in the eyes of Fletcher, who's Simmons, who is the horrendous teacher, but also if you look deeper into it, there's a really, really dark kind of realization over the final 10 minutes of the movie when the drum solo is happening. So I don't want to spoil it for everybody, but Whiplash, probably the best acting movie between J.K. Simmons and Miles Teller on my list. It's definitely up there. Um, it's one of my best 10 movies of the decade as well. I'm not going to spoil about where it is on that list, but Whiplash, unbelievable. Everyone should see it. I think you have to, I agree with you entirely. I mean, that movie was really, really fun. I remember watching it the first time. I'm like, this is so interesting. It's such different, especially like the act you said, the acting between Teller and Simmons, like really well done. And like it's not like you said, you I know you're a pan, you tend not to go for like the traditional stuff. You like to go for like a little off skilter a little bit. And, <laughs> and I'm that, hipster. Is that what you're calling me? I'm hipster with it? Sure, we'll go hipster with that. <laughs> no, I mean the movie's really good. And I mean, speaking for somebody, I don't love music. I'm not a music guy. But to make music this interesting and revolve it around the characters surrounding a topic that they're so passionate about, I fell in love with this movie and I fell in love with this type of music and the jazz. Uh, Damien Chazelle has really – he has a connection to jazz and kind of two of his major movies thus far, And but Whiplash is just unbelievable. So it's my number five favorite movie of the decade. Absolutely. So you want my number four now? Go to number four, Mike. All right, my number four. We're going back to the Nolan Will again. I know you like that one, so I'm going with Interstellar as my number four. Okay. So I know it's not the most popular Nolan film. I know it is not. It is not. I do. I did like the story here. I thought Matthew McConaughey did a good job as the leading man. I did like the whole. I guess the thing I've noticed here, some of these, I like the space element in a lot of these films. This has a good job with the space element. The Matt Damon thing. I know that was one of the most unpopular parts of that movie was him randomly showing up in the middle of it and being yeah. an unannounced main character who basically just tries to sidetrack the mission because he's mm -hmm. trying to get hell off that frozen planet he was abandoned on like i didn't mind it as much as i thought it was re a, like a realistic take like imagine imagine if you were matt damon stuck on that planet like yeah of course you would lie to say oh yeah come here it's great because i want to get the hell off this rock <laughs> and i thought the acting was good i thought jesse chastain good good job in that movie as well and obviously nolan you have the time trippy time elements that are in there and I, I thought it was intellectually challenging. I liked it a lot. I think it's a good number four. It's not my top Nolan movie, obviously, but it just grabbed me more than Dunkirk, which is why I had it higher on the list. Uh, I liked Interstellar. I didn't love it. Um, I definitely I would put Dunkirk ahead of it, uh, just in terms of, the, of my preference. But um, Interstellar, again, thought-provoking for sure. That's yeah. one thing Nolan always does with his movies. He's going to make you think. He's going to make you feel something. Uh, and Interstellar is absolutely no exception to that. Um, the one thing I love from Interstellar is the score. Hans Zimmer, I believe, did the score, yep. and it is downright incredible. Um, and it's super rewatch, super re-listenable. Um, if you play like a Spotify movie soundtrack playlist, um, it, there will be at least two or three Interstellar songs on there, without a doubt. Yeah. So Interstellar, a very, very good movie. I agree that Jessica Chastain was also the best part of that movie. She gave the best performance of the bunch. Yeah, she absolutely did. And I mean, I will spoil the fact that the one Nolan movie that did not make my list was The Dark Knight Rises. And I think just personally, I was just a little underwhelmed by that one. But again, that also, you mentioned not differing away from the source material. That was fairly accurate to the source material. It was. In the way of Bane and Batman's relationship. It was. It just did not grab me as much because, like, I think that also suffers because it got compared to The Dark Knight, which is just a masterpiece. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, nothing can compare to The Dark Knight. That's on a pedestal all of its own. And I think it just, and that was four years between the movies. I think I sort of, like, you wanted the, the follow up immediately. You waited so long, it sort of just didn't grab me as much. You know, it made like more money than Dark Knight. I think. Yeah. Also, can we talk about how so many decades list has the Dark Knight on it? It's like people forget that that was made in the in the two thousands. Yeah, it was two thousand eight. Yeah, it, people forget that there. Were, I saw decades list with it on it. And people were voting for it. I was like, that's that's not part of this decade. No. So, but again, all right, Christopher Nolan. It's hard to go wrong with it. So interesting. You have for multiple directors on your list. Uh, the kind of. I, again, I didn't give you any rules for this, yeah. but the way I approached my list was one director per for the top ten. They get yeah. one film each, just for a little bit of diversity. But yeah. you're obviously a no one head, and I love it. All right, so 
Interstellar is your number four. My number four is none, another recent addition. I may have some recency bias here, but it's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood uh, by Quentin Tarantino. Um, I think this is the best movie of the decade for him. Um, and I think the main reason I love it is because this is a love letter uh, to Hollywood. And it's a kind of trip inside the mind of Quentin Tarantino and what he likes about Hollywood and what he's experienced from Hollywood. Um, and I think that's really cool if you want to dig deep into that. There's a ton you can go into and kind of pull the different strings of the things from his real life that he put into the movie, whether it be a, a movie theater that he grew up going to or a restaurant, stuff like that. But what I also love is this is just a movie star movie. He let Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt do work. They both give award-winning performances in this one. People walked out saying this is the best Leo performance of all time. I walked out thinking Brad Pitt stole the show in this with just how cool he was as Cliff Booth. Um, but you can't. There, you can go right either way. I'm not gonna be. I'm not gonna be angry if you say Leo stole the movie. Uh, but Quentin, Quentin Tarantino really delivered Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Just awesome. It's just a great movie. And if you love Hollywood, it's impossible not to love this movie. I agree with you entirely. I think also an interesting point you brought about the whole idea of Leo's best performance coming in this movie is I think it's interesting considering like how great he was in The Revenant mm -hmm. and comparing it to this movie, I think it's just a fascinating comparison. It's like, oh, like which is better? It's a great debate. Yeah, it is a great debate. And I think Leo is one of those movie stars. He's very selective in what he does, and everything he does is pretty much good. He doesn't really have a, a bad egg in there. Um, but I, I think that Tarantino, he writes a script that's so clean, so crisp, but he also allows the actors to kind of work and to have some freedom with it, I think. Um, it's his imagination combined with theirs. And this movie, it worked so well. It was nearly three hours long, but I could have gone another half hour in this world and just let the whole entire golden Hollywood age take me over. Yeah, it says a lot, too. Like, for a movie to be long like that, you need to have it be really, really, really good to keep the audience hooked for that long. And, like... That was a problem I had with like Endgame, where I felt like it dragged at points. Like this, this one just didn't drag. All right, so now I have to ask you a question about length of movie, since the movie that is dominating this topic of conversation now yeah. is The Irishman. Have yeah. you seen The Irishman? It's on my list. I've not gotten to it it's yet. It's on your list. Again, it's over three hours long. Takes a lot of time. I think it was very, very good. I don't think time is an issue with it at all. Um, and my just overall take on people complaining about time, if you're going to complain about a movie being more than three hours, but you can binge watch The Office for four straight hours on a Saturday and have zero problem, you need to shut your mouth because it's the same exact amount of time. But guess what? The movie and The Irishman is better. Let me ask you a question then. Do you think it – like, Sirius on Netflix. Like, you have the option if you're watching on Netflix to, you know, watch an hour, pause, go run some errands, come back, watch another hour, pause. Do you think it takes away from the movie experience to do it like that? I think it takes away from the movie experience, but you have to discipline not to do it. Yeah. Like, I, when I watched The Watchmen, I watched it all the way through. I yeah. just sat down on my bed with my laptop, and I was like, I'm going to watch this, and I'm going to throw myself into it. Yeah. And it paid off. You just need to have that discipline. Yeah. That makes sense because yeah. as I feel like in this culture, it's just so hard because like especially if it's not like a common thing like the end game, people were like psyched to sit in the theater for three hours. Like this one, they're like, oh, my God, it's three and a half hours. It's Scorsese. I it's, don't know. Yeah, I don't. Again, I just think it's people people being it's just it's a different type of movie. And I don't think people were as excited for for the Irishman. It's a different type of excitement in terms of the audience it was going for. Yeah. And the people who love Scorsese and love that type of movie love the Irishman and maybe didn't love Endgame as much. But it same can be said vice versa. Yeah, so. I, I have a long one coming up, but don't worry about that. We'll get there. Okay. All right, well, hey, let's get to your number three. It's not the long one, number three, but it is another featuring Matt Damon. I'm going to The Martian from 2015. Okay. I did like this movie a lot. Obviously, the space theme with me continues again you with The really, Martian. Really? You should just be an astronaut, man. Yeah. I would I would thought about that when I was a kid, but I decided against it. And I liked it. I liked it. I thought the simplicity of the concept was genius just because, like, you see The Martian, like, oh, like, big action movie. No, it's literally just Matt Damon trying to survive on Mars while the NASA will try and get him home. And mm -hmm. it's an, basically a couple of hours of him just trying to be ingenious, kind of ways to find his own food, develop, grow his own food, find a way to sustain himself with like necessary supplies, keep from going insane. And I thought the, the fact that he spent so much time with this movie, just Matt Damon basically in a room by himself, like there was not a lot of him interacting with other people in it. I thought that was very, very good. He did a lot of great work in it. And I'd like that, I like the movie also the aspect of the ticking clock of like, oh, we have to get him back or else he'll die. And it's a nice little like urgency there towards the end, like we have to get him back. And that sort of grabbed me. I'm like, oh, I'm invested in the story. See if he gets out. I think that's made it number three for me. Yeah, and I think the the one really good thing about The Martian is this kind of 
put Matt Damon back on the superstar of Hollywood map, right? Yep. He didn't have a great movie for a long time before this. Uh, he believe he had before it, he had Interstellar, where he was a small part in, right? He had Monuments Men, which he wasn't the leading role. He had Elysium, which was a sci-fi movie that didn't have the massive blockbuster success. He had We Bought a Zoo, which was a childhood movie. Then he had Contagion, which was a very good Steven Soderbergh movie, but that was in 2011. So, again, he didn't have, like, a true award-winning Hollywood role before The Martian until, like, maybe True Grit in 2010. So that's seven years without, like, an award-winning movie from one of Hollywood's best. And The Martian was, re- was him re-stamping himself in that, in that arena. It's interesting, too, that there has not been much from Matt Damon since this either. I mean, no. I mean, he did Jason Bourne again. That was not really a good movie at that I, point. I like Jason Bourne. It was okay. I'm a sucker for Jason Bourne, though. That's why. Yeah. And, like, probably the the, best, the, the next best thing we see from him is, is Ford vs. Ferrari. It just came out. So. Yeah, and I haven't seen Ford vs. Ferrari yet, and I really want to, but I haven't seen it yet. We're not going to talk about The Great Wall. No. We won't talk about that. No, that's a disaster. <laughs> that that, that belongs disaster. in the bomb list. That belongs in the bomb list. It was yeah. not very good. Yeah. And guess what? Not very well liked across the globe. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, so my number three. Uh, speaking, I mentioned The Fall in Our Stars made me cry a lot. This movie also made me cry a lot, but I will rewatch it so many times. This is A Star is Born from 2018. Um, I cried five times during this movie, and I have rewatched so many scenes from it so many times. I bought it on iTunes when it came out. I try and get people to watch it all the time, and some people really don't like it, but I was completely starstruck by this movie. Um, the performances are very good. Lady Gaga is fantastic, but the thing is, the soundtrack, Mike, I have re-listened to it hundreds of times. You know how Spotify did, like, their top songs of, like, the year, the decade, whatever they did? The Star is Born playlist was almost almost all the songs were on, like, my top songs played of the year uh, and of the decade just because I re-listened to this so much. Um, I I love this movie. Again, it's, it's Hollywood stars really just taking the spotlight and riding with it and going full bore. Um, and for Bradley Cooper, for his directorial debut, this is a hell of a job. Um, and it hits you with so many different gut punches. Uh, you cry both happy and sad. Uh, this movie really left me reeling. And, again, was thinking about it afterwards and am still thinking about it to this day, certain scenes. Um, and if there's one karaoke song I'm always going to go to, it's going to be Shallow by Lady Gaga. I got that down pat. I love A Star Is Born. Yeah, it was done very well. I mean, it does. It did have the risk of like, oh, this movie starts to be done three times before. Is this the fourth time for this, this storyline? You're mm-hmm. thinking like, what can they do to make it different? What can they do to actually improve the storyline? They found a way to do it. They get them credit for it because when you see the first time that Lady Gaga is the lead, you're like, uh, I'm not sure about this. And then it worked out. Oh, it worked out so. It yeah. worked out so so well. Yeah. And that final. Again, I cried so much. That final scene where she's singing that final song and it cuts. Jackson Maine singing it acoustically on the piano with her weeping. Oh, just, it's like somebody just put a waterfall in my eye and just let it dribble to the floor. And I couldn't leave the theater until I composed myself after that scene. I love A Star is Born. It, it's emotional. The music is great. It tells a great Hollywood story of, of a come up and, and, obviously, and also a downfall in a really tragic way. Um, it blends happiness with sadness really well. And I love the movie. Probably... In my opinion, should have won Best Oscar in 2018. Yeah, that's a good point. So you you ready for number two for me? Yes, let's go to number two for you. And this is the marathon one. All this, right. This is not technically – it was a very limited release in theaters, but it did win an Oscar. And this was a 30 for 30 sports documentary. It's O.J. Made in America, the five-part documentary about the OJ, the life of O.J. Simpson, going back through his early days at USC, through the murder trial, through afterwards, and to me – I think in terms of documentary pieces, I think this is probably one of the best that that this ever been made in terms of this comprehensive scale because you know it's very easy just to do a two hour documentary on the murder trial and just leave it there. But mm-hmm. Ezra Edelman takes time to go back in time and look at the factors that influence OJ's upbringing, whether it was the LA race riots, the LA unrest race unrest in the sixties, whether it was like his relationships with people through like when he played in the NFL, like and the amount of people they got on camera talking about him. They had Marsha Clark. They had Mark Furman. They had Ron Shipp, who was a friend of his. They they had so many voices talking about this. They had jurors from the trial talking about this. Like they had so many perspectives. They gave you such a complete picture. And I think I've watched I've actually rewatched all five parts several times because it's just like you know, there's so much information in there. You can gain so much out of it. And it's a lot more than just 
here's why he got off of killing his wife. It's mm-hmm. like it's a lot more of like, why did this guy get to this point? And yeah. what happened after? It was more of a character study rather than a crime study, if you will. Studying him as a person rather than just focusing on the crime itself. Yeah, exactly. And I think for me, I think there's a lot of value to be gained from just rewatching it. And I think this, I think this, I know it's a long time, but it won best documentary feature, which is almost unheard of for like a sports documentary. So I think it's just really well done. It is really well done. I have not rewatched it, which I probably should go do. You're going to tell yeah. me to go do that. And maybe I should. Yeah. I remember watching it when it came out and really, really enjoying it. Um, but it didn't leave a profound impact on me like it did you. Yeah. Um, so I think I'll have to revisit this one when I have time over the summer or maybe when I'm traveling with basketball uh, because I, it, there's no denying it's really, really good. And I remember thinking this is unbelievable, all the footage they got and all the sound bites they got from people. So I'll have to revisit this one. I can't speak a lot on it because I haven't seen it since it came out, but your passion for it has reignited a fire in me to go see it again. Yeah, I love it's the true crime lover aspect of me because I feel like that always has drawn me to some of the Netflix stuff. Like, I'll watch The Staircase on Netflix. Mm-hmm. I'll watch, like, Making a Murder on Netflix. But, like, this was just so well done. And, like, I just felt like when I went back and watched it again, like, I just got, like, so much more information because there's so much being thrown at you over the course of the five things. And it's like... You can watch one a day or five days and you still get what out of it. Yeah, I'm going to have to revisit this one. It's a very good pick. It, it People do say it's the best documentary of the decade, and I think rightfully so. It's on your favorite 10 movies of the 2010s. Yeah. Um. So my number two, it's a lot different than OJ Made in America, let me tell you. <laughs> it is John Wick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 2014 action movie. I knew that was coming. I... To say I love the John Wick franchise it would be an understatement because this movie came from out of nowhere. I did not have any expectations, but when I saw it, I was utterly blown away. It is an homage to old action movies of just a good guy kicking ass because he rightfully deserves so. Um, and while, while I think John Wick isn't even the best of the franchise, this first one in 2014... This first one goes on my list because it started my love for the franchise. It started the Keanu Reeves renaissance, and this whole entire trilogy has just pushed down the gas pedal and goes balls to the wall every single time. Um, I freaking love this movie and everything it made, especially, Mike, that scene just titled Baba Yaga where he describes the boogeyman, where Keanu Reeves is smashing his guns free in the basement while the Russian mob is fearful. Uh, the boss of the Russian mob is just telling his son, you done messed up big time. Just this movie, I love corny action movies. This one isn't even corny. It's just really, really good. It touched every cornerstone of my heart. Oh, tickles yeah. my fancy. Yeah. I also love the fact you point out this is true. Like, this really saved Keanu Reeves' career. Like, he yeah. was dead like, yeah. career-wise until John Wick came out. And now all of a sudden, like, he's the next big thing again. Like, everybody wants Keanu Reeves now. How about this? I believe John Wick Chapter 4 and The Matrix are coming out on the same day yep. uh, next year, I believe yep. it is. Yeah, double Keanu. Double Keanu. I mean, I'm going to have to make that a double feature. Yeah, go back to back. You got to do. Yeah. Uh, just... The, the movies, the movies, awesome if you love action movies. Again, it, it does not deserve to win any awards because it knows exactly what it is. It's meant to appease all the action heads. And I guess what dog lovers love this movie because it's about avenging the loss of a dog. Um, and it just it hits all the marks. Uh, yeah. It's so, so, so good. All right. All That's right. my number two. All right. Let me ask you a question. You want to go to number one first? Or you want to do the honorable mentions first? You know what? That's a great point. Let's pull the audible. Let's go to honorable mentions first before we mention number one. You want to go to your honorable mentions first? Uh, sure. I'll do my honorable mentions first. Um, just run through them really quick. Uh, I have A Quiet Place in 2018, original horror movie. Just love the concept. A friend of ours watching on an airplane. Uh, that's really tough to watch on an airplane, but she did. <laughs> Poor Sam DeRosa. Uh, the Cabin in the Woods in 2011. Uh, Call Me By Your Name in 2017. Uh, for me, the Diego Maradona uh, documentary on HBO this year is probably the best documentary I saw this decade. So so, so you did get a documentary on there. I did, on yeah. my honorable mentions, but yeah. it is, it's really, really good. Yeah. Um, Drive in 2011 with Ryan Gosling. Inception in 2010, Christopher Nolan, your lover. Uh, Lady Bird, 2017. The Lego Movie, 2014. Uh, the Raid Redemption, probably the best directed action movie of the decade. Just absolutely brutal. Uh, but that was, I love that one. Rogue One, A Star Wars Story. Again, the only Star Wars one to make my list or my honorable mentions. Skyfall in 2012 and Zero Dark Thirty in 2012 as well. Those are my honorable mentions of the decade. I was surprised that Skyfall did not make your top ten. It did not, but again, the little teaser for my best movies of the decade, it made my best movies. Yeah, that, 
That sounds good. That it, does make sense. Love, love, love Skyfall so much. Uh, and I cannot wait for the new James Bond movie uh, coming out later this year in April. Um, but yes, uh, those are my honorable mentions for my favorite movies of the decade. All right, my honorable mentions. Obviously, I had some of the other superhero ones that I was a fan of this decade. The original Avengers, I thought it was a big a masterstroke when it was made. I had also Cap Two, Captain America: Civil, like Winter Soldier. Wonder Woman, the only good DC movie ever made in this decade. The only uh, Joker. Well, I'm not counting Joker. I'm counting the main, <laughs> and the main. Joker's his own thing. Joker's his own thing. Okay, I liked Wonder Woman. I have nothing against Wonder Woman. Yeah, Wonder Woman was good. Wonder Woman, Thor, Ragnarok, which I love because was, it's such a di- different take on Thor. That might be my favorite Marvel movie yeah, of all time. Yeah, it yeah. might be the Spider Man's. Both of them far home, the Marvel Spider Man, not the Amazing Spider Man. Those sucked. Mm, those were not good. I think those that would be on your bomb list. Yeah, Black Panther was on is on there. That's the end of the superhero stuff. Actually, I forgot X Men: Days of Future Past made the okay. list. Logan was on that list as well. Uh, I also had Star Trek Into Darkness. The Trekkies hated it. It I was th- so good though. It, it was, was so really good. really good. I it's the thing is with the Trekkies, you know that like if they hate something, it's probably good. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just it's again different than the source material though, different from what they expected. It was very dark, but it was really really good. It was a really good movie. The Lego movie, I agree with you because it was so genius. Oh my god, out. it's so funny. I have I have a story about that. I went to go see that at the Alamo Draft House again, my favorite yeah. place on earth. Um, and I went with my girlfriend at the time, and we're in a theater filled with almost all kids and parents. And nobody was laughing harder than me. Yeah. I was giddy with yeah. all the geeky jokes and like the references and stuff like that. And I walked out of the theater happier than happier than a clam. Yeah. And all the kids could not match the happiness I had. I yeah, because there was so loved many, the Lego movie. So many great in jokes. Like it was so perfect. It was like, and then they had the problem that well, th- I want to talk at the end. I'll talk I'll throw it to you at the end of this podcast. But like waiting too long to the sequel and then not having no momentum left for it. But. Yeah, I mean, I don't even think the sequel was bad. It just could not match the match, match, uh, match the magistry of the first. Yeah. Okay. Force Awakens is on my list. I liked it a lot. It was like I did not put the Last Jedi on the list. I had some issues with it. Mm-hmm. I had that one there. I had also Battle of the Sexes. I thought that was a good. I enjoyed that movie a lot. I haven't seen that actually. That's actually pretty good. All and right. Emma, I'll have to watch that one. I haven't Emma, seen that. Emma Stone is a good job as, as Billie Jean King. Okay, I'll have to watch that one. I haven't seen it. That was on there and Deadpool. Just because of the R-rated superhero on this and going completely opposite direction, I love that. Mm-hmm. And a controversial one, perhaps. Ten Cloverfield Lane made my list. Ten Cloverfield Lane is really I like that better than Cloverfield. Yeah, that's, that instead of the original Cloverfield. Yeah, because I think Ten Cloverfield Lane remind me, but I think that kind of came from out of nowhere. Nobody was expecting it when the first trailer dropped, right? Yeah, no, because it was marketed as something else. It was marketed as something else, and then it was like, oh wait, this is related to Cloverfield, which was a cult classic at the time, and then. John Goodman is downright terrifying he in is. that movie. He's awesome. And there's a death at the end of it that happens in a really brutal way that you don't necessarily see coming. And it it was a really, really profound thriller. And I love that it all takes place in an enclosed space, too. It just puts that claustrophobia in your in it for the entire time. Yeah, that one got me a lot more than the original Cloverfield. Because yeah, I, I agree. I, I like because I liked having only three people for most of that movie. Mm-hmm. And like Goodman, uh, I think with Mary Elizabeth Winstead, I think was the uh, yeah. main. I forget who the third guy was, but like I don't remember. But like I, those three playing off each other was very interesting. The, you had the paranoia aspect of like, is he telling the truth? Is Goodman lying to her? Like you have like because the whole thing is like there's a contagion outside. You'll die if you leave. And then like it's just crazy. And then you see like at the end like oh that's how it ties to Cloverfield. And then like it's fun because like. So I think the third one didn't even tie the first two. No, we don't talk about the third one on the third, Netflix. It the was third, dreadful. The third one, third, the third one's on the bomb list. It was really, really bad. Yeah. Uh, John Gallagher Jr. is the third party in Ten Cloverfield Lane. Oh, from Newsroom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I actually haven't seen Newsroom. I should watch that. Stephen Storkin. Can't believe I haven't seen it. Yeah, you would like that. I probably would. Yeah. Um, that, those are those are good honorable mentions. Yeah. I like Ten Cloverfield Lane. I actually kind of forgot about that one, and it's very, very good. Yes. All right. So good. You ready for number one? All right. Give me number one, Mike. Number one. Back to Nolan. Inception. Okay. It has to be Inception for me because that movie, when it came out, it just raised the bar of like what you could expect out of a movie. Just because obviously, A plus casting with Leo DiCaprio, I think it one of his better performances of the decade. I said think the Revenant was better, but like he was great in that movie. A plus supporting cast, it made you think a lot in terms of like this is the first movie I really remember where you like walk out of like theorizing about what you just saw and like oh I need to see that again to figure out what I just watched because. The idea is so simple. Like, we're going to plant an idea in this guy's head, but there's so many layers to it in terms of, like, 
you're building dreamscape upon dreamscape upon dreamscape, and it's like you're forgetting that time is going sh longer in each separate one. You worry about getting lost in somebody's mind. It's like it makes so many layers to it. I just love the complexity of it, and they leave you the great stinger at the end with the spinning totem. You're like, it, did he make it out of there? Is he still in the dream space, or mm -hmm. is he actually awake and conscious in this world? Although that was fun. People are still debating it to this day whether he's awake or not. I think to me that's a great point for why it should be up there. Yeah, but the thing is, didn't no one himself say, hey, no, he's in the real world? Didn't he debunk that myth himself? But just fans have just been like, no, no, and you're wrong. There's arguments on both sides on this one. Basically, I, got, he, I think he said something to that effect of like, guys, he's awake. Like, yeah. And they calm down, and they're still going nuts about it. Again, but that, again, I mentioned in the beginning, the way I determine a favorite is if it makes you think about it after. And yeah. there's no doubt Inception did that. Yeah. It's really, really good. It was uh, no one's first uh, Best Picture nominee. They followed it up with Dunkirk, which also you mentioned earlier. Um, so I, I really did like Exception. I think this was also kind of Tom Hardy's breakout role. I think a lot of people were introduced to Tom Hardy in this movie. And what I remember from this movie is, though, Joseph Gordon, love it, and that fight scene in the hallway with the anti-gravity. Yeah. And I remember watching how they filmed that on various YouTube videos of behind the scenes and just, un, just unbelievable work. Uh, it, and this movie, I believe it was nominated. Uh, it actually won for Best Cinematography in yeah. creating something like that. So, yeah. again, Inception is really, really good. It's probably my third favorite Nolan movie. Probably my third favorite. Of all time or of the decade? Of all time. Yeah, that's... Probably. What are the top two? Dark Knight and Dunkirk. Yeah. Hard to argue with those two. I think those are my top two, but Inception is there at number three. I, was like, I think for me, Dark Knight would be one, then this would be two. Okay. All right. Hey, we love that. It's a great movie. No, yeah. no doubt about it. And everyone should see it to see that ending because yeah. it is, it's profound. It's really, really good. Guys, we love movies. Movies are really good. <laughs> yeah, movies are lots of fun. They are. Um, all right, so we get to my number one, and uh, again, I love action movies. John Wick was my was my number two, uh, and number one is action movie porn. It is <laughs> Mad Max Fury Road. Uh, it came out in 2015, directed by George Miller, and holy hell, what a ride. Just utter madness. Um, this movie is basically, the way they wrote out this movie was like a comic book. They didn't write out a screenplay. They wrote it out in pictures and then put the pictures to life. And they put it to life with so many practical effects, and they made it look so goddamn cool with everything they did, kind of avoiding CGI when they possibly could, that this movie is to, is just an action movie that pumps you with adrenaline and then increases the dosage as you go out. Um, the first half of the movie is kind of, a, is kind of an escape, and then the second half is a race back. Uh, it, it's a back-and-forth tale, but... It, the action is just unbelievable. Uh, also, Charlize Theron as Imperial Furiosa is probably in my Mount Rushmore of most badass female characters of all time. Uh, she's up there with like Ellen Ripley, the bride from uh, Kill Bill, um, and oh my god, I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting one, I'm for and Sarah Connor from Terminator, uh, from Terminator 2. She's up there. Tom Hardy is great as Mad Max. The movie is just, it has a look and feel of its own. The way it, it kind of speeds up the frame rates, slows things down, uh, the way it kind of hints to you at a further universe about, like, the idea of these these crazy individuals spraying the silver stuff on their teeth and then screaming Valhalla that it's not completely explained to you, but you buy into it so fully because you can tell that George Miller loved making this movie and it was his passion project. Um, Mad Max Fury Road is my favorite movie of the decade. I've rewatched it countless number of times. I've tried to get people to watch it with me, and be like, oh, what's your favorite movie recently? And I try and get them to watch Mad Max, Mike. And guess what? A lot of people don't like it. They're like, this is weird. Like, the first 10 minutes of the movie throws you into the fire, and it's either you buy in or you don't. Um, and a lot of people have been put off by it, but I love Mad Max Fury Road. It also garnered a ton of award texture, which I think it deserved. People recognize it as one of the best action movies ever. And for me, it's my favorite movie of the decade. I remember before I saw it, when I saw that it was getting all these awards, I'm like, Wait, really? Mad Max is getting up wars? And I was like, oh, I get it now. I get why it's up there. It was really, really fun. Yeah, I mean, it, the, it's the whole thing is braggadocious. Like it, everything is over the top. They have a guitar here. They have a gu guy playing a flame throwing guitar, but it makes <laughs> sense in the movie. That's the thing. You buy into it with all the big drums. There's really a, a car that is just meant to make noise, but you buy into it. Um, and the fact that they're also looking into a sequel now with, uh, I believe, Mad Max The Wasteland is kind of the working name for it, and George Miller is back. I am so on board. Um, I will get in my car and speed to the theater to see it. Uh, Mad Max Fury Road, my favorite movie of the decade. 
hard to argue with it because it was a lot of fun. I will admit that. Like, it did not it was not my personal cup of tea, which is why it did not make my list. But mm-hmm. like, I could understand the appeal of people like you, which is like so enthralled by it. Yeah, and I mean, I've watched how they made the movie, how they did all the car crashes, all the practical effects. It all it looks gorgeous. And to anyone who loves action movies, you have to see Mad Max Fury Road. Yeah, let me ask you one question before we before we wrap this up. Yes, do it. Uh, you mentioned before the Dark Knight was on like a uh, best of the decade list. You know, like they're not on this decade. Do you find that same thing with Avatar? No, yeah. I would not have Avatar. I said, you, did you see it on lists? Um, no, I did not. I don't think I did. Now the, th- I think the thing about Avatar is when it came out, it was super important because it revolutionized the movie industry with its technology and the way it looked. Yeah. Um, but I think it's kind of fallen out of favor as years have gone by. Yeah. But there's no denying. I think I gave Avatar an A on my Excel sheet here because when I saw it, I saw it twice in theaters because I was like, holy crap, this movie is completely and utterly different. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it was. But uh, but I don't see it on a lot of top ten lists. You're right about that. I'm surprised about that. And it's, I'm also curious because I feel like it's kind of gotten forgotten because he's been waiting so long to make all these sequels because he's like waiting for the technology to catch up. Yeah. And it makes me wonder, like, are, are the expectations not going to be so huge when it, when it does actually come out to be a massive disappointment? Yeah, and I think – when the when the movie came out, the technology kind of overcame all the story pitfalls. Is when you think about it, it's like, if you think about it, unobtainium is the uh, thing that they're chasing after, right? Yeah. It's literally unobtainable. It's like they just took a word and reshaped it and made that the MacGuffin of the movie, which is not very inspiring. Yeah. And again, if you look at it, it's a lot like Pocahontas or whatever. And again, the story's not very inspiring. But again, when Avatar came out, the technology was so good that you just kind of oversaw those things. They're like, oh, that doesn't matter. This the way to look, the way this movie looks, and the way it makes you feel is more important. Now Cameron kind of has to tie both of those knots together and be like, hey, we got two pieces of dangling rope here: technology and the story. Because now more people realize the story of the original Avatar wasn't great. He's got to make both of them really good now as upcoming sequels. I think there's four sequels or something like that. He's I, filming continuously, like, all at the same time. Yeah, I mean, like, these are supposed to originally come out, like, like 2014. It came 2017. It keeps getting pushed back. Yeah, because, yeah. like, for me, it's like there's just so much hype on them. It's like there's, there's no possible way they can succeed, right? Because, like, this movie was the number one, like, all-time, like, box office seller until Endgame took it down this year. And, like, now you have these movies, I think – was it now 2023 or something, the first one's coming out, and then 2025, the second one? I think one? it's 2021. I'm actually going to look this up now, though. Because um, it, because I'm looking at it, like, it's hard to do a sequel 14 years after the first one came out. It really yeah, is. No, it is. It is. No, with that being said, now, Toy Story was able to do it, right? Toy Story 3 was pretty darn good after it had almost a decade well, off. Well, Toy Story's a different beast, though, because Toy Story is, like a, is a family-friendly movie. This is true. This is true. Where you basically, like... The generation sort of like aged up to the next film, which I think was interesting because, like, remember, first was 95, second was 99, third was 2010, was 11 years, and then the first, fourth one was nine years. So, like, between the first and the fourth movie, it's 25 years. Yeah. And I think a good example of a sequel that came way too far in the future uh, was like Indiana Jones 5. Yeah. Right? Nobody liked, nobody liked, uh, no, it wasn't five. Was it five? No, it was four. Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, right? Yes. Yeah. So. Again, that came out decades after Last Crusade, and people did not like Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, and they just don't include it in their Indiana Jones like filmography. That just doesn't exist. Yeah, but guess what? They're going back to the Indiana, Indiana Jones well in a couple of years, I think. Yeah, it's like Rocky V kind of too. Like Rocky V was just ruined the Rocky franchise. And then oh they, my they, god, they, we gotta talk about Rocky V. And then Balboa came out a couple of, like about a decade later because they cause Sylvester Stallone was like, you know, I cannot end the franchise like this. And then. That led to that, then they did Creed about another decade after that, and then they spun the franchise off, and they've done pretty well since. They've done very well since. So, yeah. listen, movies are a ton of fun. Sequels are a hot debate, and but I think this past year, 2019, was a really good in terms of just a quality year. So before I let you go, Mike, off the top of your head, your favorite two or three movies from this year that you have seen? That I have seen. That's going to narrow it down quite a bit. They're not going to do as many movies listen, as you're I want. Listen, you're a very busy man. I know this. Yeah, I think in terms of movies I've actually seen, I want to say – I will put Spider-Man, like, Homecoming, Far From Home is number one this year because I think it was just so much fun just to be to. And, like, coming off the big, like, blah, that was Endgame. <laughs> it was just sort of, like, all kind of barfed together into, like, one thing. It's like, nostalgia, fun, action. And, like, it's just so overwhelming. It just kind of grounded it again. I thought that was kind of – that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that aspect of it. That was number one. Number two for me, I would say Toy Story 4. Toy Story 4? Hey, listen, I love Toy Story 4. Again, you didn't we, need it. I did, We did not need it, but they did it correctly. They did a very, very good job. And this is going to be the hot take that probably gets you kicked off this podcast for a little while. Number three, I think, of what I've seen, I've, I've not seen much, 
I would put live action Aladdin ahead of the other two Marvel movies. I have not seen Aladdin. I have not seen live action just because I have, have not had a strong desire to see it. I, I liked it a lot. I thought, like I, I've said a couple of times on my own podcast, Justin the Suffering podcast, I've said, like, you know what? I thought the, the colors popped on it. The Most of the performers are pretty good. Like, the problem with it, obviously, was the guy who gave cast for Jafar mm-hmm. stunk. That's that's a not, big that's a big problem. Not good when your bad guy is the worst part of the movie. Not good, but like Will Smith was very good in his role. Naomi Scott killed it as Jasmine. The guy who they cast as Aladdin was very good. And the fact he's not gotten any auditions since that movie came out is a crime because he was actually pretty good. The fact that they're spitting off like the random white side character and and in the Disney Plus universe says a problem a lot about the issue of like getting actors equal like representation in Hollywood. Yeah, the actor for Jafar was Marwan Kanzari, yeah, I believe he, his name was. Yeah, he was so bad. Yeah, again, I heard he was really bad. I, I'm going to eventually watch Aladdin. I'm going to eventually watch Dumbo. But and then uh, those two live-action movies came out this year, and I just really didn't have a large interest in seeing them. Yeah, because for me, it was like there's not much other choices. Because, I mean, Endgame, I could not put in the top three because there was just too many issues for it with me. I had Captain Marvel, which did not grab me like I thought it would have. And, like, I think off the top of my head, like, live-action Lion King was a disappointment. All right. Fair enough. Those are Mike's top three movies of 2019 that he's seen. But we went through our top ten movies of the decade really fast. But, Mike, before I let you go, we're just to recap your top ten favorite movies of the decade. We got Toy Story 3, Dunkirk, 42, Rogue One, Now You See Me, Infinity War, Interstellar, The Martian, O.J. Made in America, and Inception. I still sense the, the uh, smirking as you read Now You See Me. Now You See <laughs> Me is not a good movie, but you like it, so that's all that matters. Uh, for myself, my number 10 is Parasite. My number 9 is It. My number 8, Toy Story 3. We agree on that one. My number 7, Hereditary. Number 6, Logan. Number 5, Whiplash. Number 4, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Number 3, A Star is Born. Number 2, John Wick. And number 1, Mad Max Fury Road. So, Mike, I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking this hour to talk movies with me. I absolutely love it. For those who want to follow what you do, both in your podcast and social media, where can people find you? If you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at mphillips331. That's M-P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S-331. It's a very confusing Twitter handle because I got in the game very late. All the versions of my name were actually taken, so I had to come up with some sort of hodgepodge of initial, last name, birthday. But if you want to listen to this to my podcast, which John has been on several times, including— I love it. Including, we've done Watchmen a couple times, done some movie stuff, we've done Avengers, there'll be more coming out with John. Search for the Just End the Suffering podcast. It's on iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, Spotify, and Stitcher. Do some pop calls there. Also, a lot of New York sports stuff as well. So, if you're already a sports fan, come on over and listen. Mike Phillips does a little bit of everything. For myself, I am at jstanko99 on Twitter. That's where you find most of my takes, as well as stankosstance.wordpress.com for all my movie takes and reactions. So thank you, everyone, for listening. What are your top ten favorite movies of the decade? Let us know. Thanks for listening. Until next time, this has been Stanko Stance. There you go. Nailed it. That was fun. That was very good.